before we start, I just want to give you a bit of context. Um, and we're going to just quickly look at a, at a one minute clip. So this is going to help us to set the scene for this conversation this morning. So I'm inviting you just to quickly watch with me this clip and then we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty details. Okay, sure. Think of the biggest organizational challenge that you're trying to solve right now. It might be a lack of accountability or low employee engagement, it could be poor communication or conflict or simply resistance to change. In our work with clients, we found that most organizations find themselves in this never-ending struggle to solve these very issues. Year after year, they roll out new training initiatives, they hire new consultants, or they implement some new strategy, but the same problems persist. It's a little like they're in search of this perfect seed to plant in their organization, hoping that it's going to grow into the solution to their problem. But then, when the seeds don't grow, they tend to blame the seed, and then they go out and look for new solutions, not recognizing that they've planted that seed in toxic soil. But those who successfully solve these challenges, they come to recognize that they're not really separate issues. They're all just symptoms of a deeper issue. The problem is in the soil. So we first have to fix the soil. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with this soil? What is this fundamental problem that we've discovered? It's that people show up to work too often thinking only about themselves. And this self-focus, this inward mindset keeps them from considering all of the needs of other people, of recognizing their impact on the people around them. Is it possible that this inward mindset is at the heart of the challenges in your organization? If so, then the single most important factor in achieving sustainable change is creating a fundamental shift to an outward mindset. In fact, that is your work. Your work is to create a shift in mindset. And then out of this new mindset, this new soil, will grow the behaviors you need in order to achieve the results that you want. And we'd love to show you how to make that happen. Okay, so I love the metaphor that Arbinger uses to speak about the soil. You know, given the, the company that I'm with here this morning, I think it makes actually more sense, right? So I want to ask you, I'm, I'm really inquisitive to understand what, how you would describe the soil in this company. How would you look at it, you know? How would you describe it? You know, what's the things that happens on a daily basis? How do people work with one another or not? Okay, so very intrigued about that, but we're going to explore that. And at some stage during the morning is we're going to assess the company soil. Okay, so we're going to take a look at Afgri in its, in its totality. So first of all, we're going to pull a couple of frameworks from these three books. Now, I've already given you a book away from le with leadership and self-deception. So maybe just a little bit about me and Krista, thank you very much for the introduction, is that I got introduced to this book 11 years ago um, because I was perplexed. Because wherever I went working with companies, I saw the same problems. Have you, you know, some of you have been with Afgri maybe for a long time, some of you come from other types of companies. It's not unique. I always say same problem, different address. Right? Have, you, have you had that experience? You know, it's the same things that you experience. It doesn't matter where you go. So I said to myself, I need to figure out what's going on. And then I stumbled on, on this book, Leadership and Self-Deception. Now, an interesting thing about this whole idea of self-deception, and Crystal mentioned me coming from the free state, you know, and I thought like, and what's, what's self-deception? So I want to ask you, if you think about this. So the way that we think about self-deception, it's the problem of not knowing I have a problem and I blame others for the problem. So have you seen that problem in organizations where people are creating problems for other people in the business, but they don't actually acknowledge it or they don't even see it in themselves? Now you can imagine if you go to someone and say, hey, Maria, it's Maria, am I right? Maria. I think you're a problem, right, uh, for, for this team or for this organization. How do you think she's going to react? Who, me? Defensive, yeah, that's, it's all of them, right? 
so when I read this book, it is absolutely, it opened up my eyes and I thought like, I need to do everything in my power to bring Arbinger to South Africa. So 11 years on, love this work. And there's also some other publications out with Mindset and then also Anatomy of Peace, which some of you might have the opportunity to win today, depending on what's going to happen. Okay. So um, I'm, I gladly want to share these books with you. So we're going to pull a couple of frameworks from these books. Now that small little booklet that I gave you, we're going to, there's one or two frameworks we're going to look at at some stage. So don't worry about that. Um, but it's just, just for us as a reference guide so that we can go back to this. Okay. So I'm going to start off with this whole notion of we're going to take a look at how we can make things 400% easier by applying SAM. Okay. So th there's three ideas that we're going to pull from this book. 400% easier SAM. Okay, so that's going to be the whole conversation is going to be around these three ideas. So let's start with this whole notion of 400%. Okay, so it is absolutely, it's a given, we're going to start somewhere short and we're going to say we know that behavior drives results. Okay, so your behavior will have a huge impact on your current results. But that does not only just apply to individuals, it also applies to, to teams and to organizations. So the behavior of people in an organization ultimately impacts the results in the business. But there's a notion that we don't always look at that much. And this is the whole thing about mindset. So what drives behaviors in a company? It's not just behaviors. There's something deeper that actually determines our behavior right which actually impacts our result now here's some interesting things around this studies have shown that now these studies are by well-known research houses and companies that focuses on this type of work they have found that if you're only focusing on driving behavior in a company so typically how do we drive behaviors on companies we have values statements we have culture we want to drive a particular way of how people behave right so they said that if you only focus on behavior your results will be x okay so if you're just thinking about behavior trying to drive behavior you will get to x but if you focus on driving mindset and behavior in a company your results would be four times more than the actual current results so if you're just focusing on behavior you're going to get somewhere but if you focusing on mindset and behavior, it's going to actually impact it in a huge way. Now, interesting, the same research I found, it is the mindsets of the leaders in the company that drives the mindset in the company. So the higher up in the company, the mindset of, of the exco and the senior leaders in the company, they will determine the rest of the mindset in the company. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So here we have this. So I want to ask you, if you think about Afgri, what do you think is the current share price of, of Afgri? Do you, anyone know the share price? No, it's not listed. Not listed? Okay. What would you say is the, is the results then of the company? How would you describe it? So let me ask you this. Let me rephrase it. On a scale from 1 to 10, what would you say is the current results of the company? One being is we're not reaching our targets. We're not achieving what we've set out. Five is some, in some areas of the business, we achieve that. In some areas, we don't. Ten is we're super exceeding our own objectives. How would you describe it? So let me hear. Six. Seven. Six. Anyone have anything higher than a seven or a six? What would you say, sir? Five? Uh, six. Six. Okay. Right. So how we think about it, given coming back to this whole idea about behaviors and mindset, is that the collective and the individual behaviors of everyone in this company determines the six or the seven or the five. Okay. So if you look at it, this, this is how behavior drives results. Now the question again, just to bring this in, is mindset actually drives the behaviors. So where do you think this company wants to operate in the future? Where do you want to take the company? To a 10? To a 9? Okay. So how are you going to get there? So if we say we have a new goal, right? How are you going to get there? So you, you the people in the company, how do we typically go about saying is, this is the current status quo. We want to operate here in the future. What do we typically do? 
change, change, change the culture. Motivation of people, right? We say to people, you have to change your mindset, right? How does it work for you? Do they change their mindsets? Does, does the culture shift? Just to say that we have a culture, do people actually buy into the culture? No. What else? How do we typically go about achieving our strategies? Let me hear from the people there at the back. What would you say? What do we do in business? Innovative. We say to people they have to be more innovative. Am I right? Okay. Can you tell people to work harder? They've got to change their behavior. Yeah. Focus on the behavior. And if they don't, what do we do then? Yeah, we, we, we actually say, if you don't going to do this, this is what's going to happen to you, right? It's almost like the, the carrot and the stick approach, okay? What else? Just chase the, um, not change the focus, change the focus point, but there's the focus point. How are we going to get there? Okay, so here's what typically happens, okay? What we try, we try and do this. We prescribe the behaviors. So we say, we want you to do X. We want you to continue these things. We want you to stop doing these things. We actually want you to start doing these things. Do people do it? Maybe they, they try and sometimes they actually attempt it. But what happens if we don't change this? What do you think is going to happen with the behaviors? Yeah, we're going to go back to the status quo, right? So people are not changing. So your experience is also, like mine, is that it, it's not sustainable change. It's just lip service very often. Okay. So if we want to bring about the change that we need to desire in a company, we need to change mindset and behaviors. Okay. So we can't just focus in on, on behaviors alone. So I want to share this story with you, this whole idea, notion about 400%. What happens when people change mindset? So I'm going to introduce to you a gentleman he is a, is a major in Kansas Police Department. So let's just talk about SWAT. Do you know what SWAT does? So what SWAT are those guys with big guns. They, they raid houses. They go and go after the, the big criminals and they actually pull them. And, you know, they might do various things when they actually enter house. But this gentleman, right, him and his team created more problems for Kansas than the whole police department collectively. Okay. So how do we know this? They had almost three to four lawsuits filed against them every month. Okay. In the way they treat people, right? In the way they do their business. So people had lawsuits filed against them. And the cost for the, for the previous 10 years before he changed amounted to 25.2 million US dollars. So if you translate that into times 14, it's quite a big amount that the cost and the waste that produced the way that he operated. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of a case study and then I'm going to ask you some questions and listen carefully because you might win a book. Okay, right. Okay, we're approaching our turn. We're going to be right out. Just tough and we're mean and we talk down to people. I'm the police officer and you're the bad guy and you're gonna do what I say. We just went out every night. As some people would say, we harassed them. We went out and just put people in jail. That was our job. I don't care who you are, what you did, this is the way I'm gonna deal with you. Screw off, you can sit there in the snow. What's this idiot doing standing here on the corner? Why didn't he go get a job? Why, you know, why is he, why is he out here, you know, ruining my day? We were one of the most complained on squads uh, on the department. We used to get a number of complaints out of that that unit. The times I would get phone calls, the times my captain would get phone calls, people complaining, and it created stress in my life. How can we fix this? How do we get this back to where we want to go? Because this is not where we want to go. I was in a really weird place because I was feeling all the self-doubt and, and looking back on a lot of things that I, that I had done and I was very disappointed in myself. Everybody's problem was just a problem. It's not my problem. I don't really care. I'm getting paid to do what I do. 
I've seen people come and go through this unit where it just drove them nuts. The job is extremely isolating and you feel like people don't understand. We were going down a bad path on a destiny for a, for a crash landing. As a leader, I was too self-centered. I felt like I had to start all over again. Like I didn't know what to do. So um, we said, well, you know what, why don't we try and get these people into the class and see, see what happens. I came pretty much as an excuse to be away from my normal duties for three days. Going into the class, I was still, mm, it's still a class, whatever. And then I sat and kind of listened to the stories and the examples. Other people talked. I just sat back and went, wow, I thought I was the only one that did that or felt that. We start talking about leadership. We start talking about this idea of seeing people as people. And I never looked at it like that. Everybody was, the, was an object and, and, and just something that I had to do. For me, um, what I liked about the, the material was that it kind of spoke to me personally. And then I got to see how it applied professionally. If even one person came up and said, you know, well, you know this gave me a whole new way to talk to my son or my coworker that I just couldn't reach before, or anything like that. And there was not a class that went by that we didn't have at least somebody that said that. Arbinger prompts us to question the way that we're doing things and our way of being. And the amazing thing I see with conversations where people completely let their guard down and relationships are formed. Traditionally, people have just had their, uh, their guard up whenever you see the, the uniform come at them, letting them know that, hey, it doesn't have to be a contentious a communication between us. It could, definitely can be a new day if more people in the law enforcement community would, would adopt these philosophies as a means of, of doing their uh, everyday business. After talking about these concepts and kind of adopting them in the way we do things, uh, we went three and a half years with no complaints. We haven't had a, a complaint related to a search warrant. We went like five years without a complaint related to a search warrant. And in that time, they received an award from the chief for recovering more guns and more drugs and more money than in the previous decade. We just don't receive any complaints out of that unit at all. I just think it's the way that they have learned to interact with people. Yeah, you're still a police officer, but I felt like Every situation and, and every issue was its own. And I truly feel like, even though if I take an extra five or 10 minutes with an individual more so than I would have before, I feel like when I've left, I feel like I've truly helped somebody. Okay, so just maybe just a little bit more background to the situation. How many lawsuits do you think they've got filed against them in the last 10 years? How would you say? Three. Zero. Consistently. So they've saved Kansas 25 million US dollars in the last 10 years, right? He changed. One person changed and it has a huge ripple effect. So I want to ask you, what did you hear from this clip? There's a couple of nice golden nuggets in there which actually makes a lot of sense. Actually, um, lacking us behind in a certain way, but it's actually always ourselves. Which, because even if somebody tells you something, it hurts you. It's because you have a something that you have to work on yourself. Correct. So you can only change the way that you handle the situation. You cannot change other people's behavior. Correct. Yes. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. You've just won yourself a copy of Leadership and Self Deception with that note. Okay. So can, I can't go there because the cameras are sitting there. I'm just going to pause it on. Thank you so much. What else? What else stood out for you? Action speaks louder than words. Yeah. What did he say? Chip said something. You can't do what? You can't just instruct or tell people how to do things. You need to actually be doing it yourself. Correct, yes. And there was something else that in addition to that, he also said, can't talk yourself out of a situation you've behaved yourself into, right? So I can't come in here one day and say, we're going to change things if I didn't change myself. Fantastic. Anything else that stood out for you? What did, about his son? There was something about his son that I thought was very interesting. Um, I'm coming to you now. His son said to him that uh, he cannot understand because he sort of looked at him as if like, 
is a robot, it can tell you to do anything and what you have emotions, mm -hmm. for which he did have emotions. Mm -hmm. But once the son said that to me, he had to reflect on himself and say, what, what is wrong that I'm doing? Mm -hmm. I don't show emotions. It means when I go to work, I'm this kind of a person that says, you will have to do this without even thinking for them mm -hmm. and asking them, how are you today? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying that you're going to do this. Correct. So in that way, it's sort of a reflection to say that as much as you thought that they were the problems, he was the problem himself. Correct. Sure, I'm coming back to you now. Thank you so much for that. Well, just to add what she says, uh, she hit the nail on the coffin. There's a drive for leadership to actually lead us to have emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. which is one thing that he was lacking. Because without emotional intelligence, you, you lack listening skills. Whatever you feel is right will always be right, mm -hmm. instead of actually being able to listen to others. Okay, so let's talk about this whole thing about emotional intelligence here. Sorry, sure. I just want to add. What's your name? Andre. Andre. Um, what I also heard was when you had the realization, he said somewhere this is a process yes. and he couldn't just force it on them mm -hmm. and he had to have one-on-one -on -one sessions because he, or, or engagement with uh, these people because they also are different. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, for sure. It's a process. Okay. Leadership is not you alone. Oh, yeah. Because the whole team that actually... It assisted him in the leadership or the decision that he took, but he didn't take it afterwards at home. We initially made it done so. Great. So we need a team of people, and when leadership changed, it has an impact on the team. You remember my, my quote I said, you know, it's, it's the mindsets of leaders that determines the mindsets of people around them. Okay. Coming back to this EQ thing. So emotional intelligence speaks about how do I impact other people. So if you think about his son, he didn't even see himself correctly about how he impacts other people. So in some way, this is the self-deception. We get blind to how we impact other people. So here's my first challenge for you for today, right? Post this next hour or 90 minutes. I want to invite you to go and ask one person at home and one person at work, what is it to live with me and what is it to work with me? Because sometimes we don't know how we impact other people. Right? So I want to really invite you, go home tonight and just ask people, you know, how is it when I show up at home, what is it to, to live with me? And hear what they say. But sometimes people are very afraid to, to say how we impact them. So I think what it would be a good thing is, you know, when the kids are being bathed and, and, and things are happening at home, please don't go ask someone, say, you know, I've got this guy today and he said, I need to ask you a question about what is it to live with me? You're not going to get the right answer. So just make sure that when it's a little bit quiet at home tonight, you know, when you drive home, just think about how will I approach this and just ask someone, how is it to live with me? I really want to understand. And don't just give me the positive things. Give me the things that, that you feel afraid to actually share with me. Because in the case with, with Chip's son as well. Sometimes people at home are much more honest about how we impact them than at work. But it, I think you, if you have a good trusting relationship going on at work, just ask the person sitting next to you in the office, what is it really to, to work with me? Okay. So that being said. Okay. So let's get into this whole thing. We're gonna, so this was just the introduction. Now we're going to get a little bit more granular around this thing that's easier. And remember, I spoke to you and I asked you, can you think of people at home and at work that makes things for you easier and people that are making things harder for you? Okay, so we, we're going to talk about those two groups of people. So in the easier category, so how we think this, we pretty much say very broadly categorize this, two types of people in the world, right? They are a person or people that looks like this. People who makes it easier for us. So I want to ask you just to think. So we, we won't go the other direction, but just who are the persons at work that makes things easier for you? Can, you? can you recall those people? Do you know those people at work? What makes, what is it that they do that makes it easy to work with them? What do you think? What, what would that be? How would they look like? How do they show up at work? Okay. So we, yeah, Maria. From my side, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, <laughs> again. I think it's somebody who can trust, 
and you know always she is available for everybody she can listen mm -hmm. whatever it takes she's a friend she's mm -hmm. a colleague she's everything for you yes so it's someone that understands you. Is that is that what you're saying? Okay. So here's an interesting that, thing that happens with people who makes it easier, right? So we, we're going to talk about them, but then we're going to talk about people at work and at home that makes things harder for people around them. And that might include us as well, right? Okay. We might make it harder for other people, and sometimes we might make it easier for other people. Similarly, on the other side. So here's something that interesting that happens with people who makes it easier for other people. They have a particular way of engaging with people. What they tend to do is they start to think about, but other people in the business, in my team, matter like I matter. So that's the way they look at the world, right? So when people matter, like you said, Maria, I'm, I'm interested in, in your challenges. I want to understand you. I want to understand your needs. I want to stand, understand your objectives, right? Things that, that's important to you because your stuff is as important as my stuff, right? So we matter the same on this level. Now, people who, who makes it easier, right? What they tend to do is they start to, they are very concerned about other people's stuff, right? How they impact them. Okay. Then what they do is they start to, plan and execute their work in such a way that it helps other people with their needs and their objectives. Now, I want to make it very clear, they're not doing their work for them. Okay? They just plan and execute their work in such a way that it would be helpful for someone else. Okay? That's people who makes it easier. Now, let's look at the opposite. Okay? And this is the, the interesting. So can you think about people in your, in your life at work that actually operates in this way? They're always concerned about what you're busy working on, some of your objectives, and then they start to try and execute and they plan their way in such a way that it would be helpful to you. Do you know those people? Are there many of them? <laughs> okay, right. So, they're few, but they're there, right? And sometimes we like this as well. We, we ask people about their needs and then we start to plan how we can help them. But sometimes we down here, making it harder for other people. Now, people who makes it harder for others, other people don't matter like they matter. Okay, so people with this, this type of mindset, the only thing they're concerned about is their needs and their objectives, things that are important to them. They know, so let's say I'm inward towards you, okay, and we work in an organization together. I might say, yes, I know your needs, I know your objectives, I know the things that you need to take care of, but I don't care. I know that, but I don't care. The only thing that I'm interested in is how am I going to get you to help me achieve my objectives? Don't care about the stuff that you need to take care of. Right? So it looks like this. Okay? So although people have goals and needs and objectives, I don't pretty much care about those. Okay? And we're going to get into this conversation just now. So it looks like this. The only thing I'm concerned about is my stuff. I'm not alive and interested in what's happening in the rest of the organization or in the next division or in the next team where I need to operate, right? And then we start to see people as objects. So I'm going to use this chair as an example, okay? So when we see people as objects, we can see them in a couple of ways. And you might want to make notes of this. So let me use this chair as an example. So if I get onto this chair, right? Because I want to change the data projector. What does this chair become to me? Support. It's a support, it's a tool, right? So I get onto this to actually achieve my result as to change the data projector. Okay. So this is a, in Arpinger terms we say this is a vehicle. Okay. So I use it to get to my stuff. So who are the people in this company that might be seen as vehicles. The only time that I engage them is when I want something from them or when I can actually use them to achieve my objectives. Have you ever felt like in being, being engaged in this way because the only time when people approach you or engage you is when they want something from you? Have you had that experience? Okay, consistently. Oh my goodness, okay. A doormat, right? So almost in that same way. So I want to ask you, what do you do when you feel like you've been treated like a vehicle? So the only time that people engage you is when they want something from you. What do you do? How do you feel when that happens? 
Do you want to engage that person in the future? No, you turn more inward. Yeah, exactly. It actually invites you to actually say, you know, I'm not going to be really as helpful to you. Now, here's what I do is when, when people treat me like vehicles, I try to ignore them and find ways not to engage them. Okay, because the only time they engage me is when they want something from me. Okay, so let's say I put this chair here and I want to exit the room. What is the chair from here? Obstacle. So it's in my way. So who are the people in our work environment that are obstacles to us? So they're in my way to actually help me achieve my objective. Who are those people? Okay. So that's another way. That chair, they right at the back. What is that chair to me right now when it stands there? Nothing. Nothing. It doesn't impact me. So it's, it's irrelevant. So another way we can see people as objects is when we see them as irrelevancies. We don't ask them, we don't engage them because they don't impact my results. So will they, Im will they impact me when I leave the room, that chair? No. So who are the people in this business that might be seen and feel like they've been treated as vehicles or obstacles? They're being seen as problems, right? What do we do when we have problems? We work around them, right? When, because we don't like problems, right? Or if we, if we can't work around them, what do we do? We push them aside, right? So we remove them. We put them somewhere else where they don't impact on us. There's a fourth way that sounds very interesting. Where we see people as objects is where they become hazardous. Do you know those people in the business? They're dangerous, right? You don't mess around with them, but that's another way we can see people as objects. Okay. And I want to start to ask you, what do you do when you see people in this way? And what happens when people start to see you as an object? What, what happens? What's the dynamic that actually translates? Okay. So we're going to talk about that. Now, this thing about outward and inward. So we're saying, so people that makes it easier for other people have an outward mindset. People that makes it harder for other people, they have an inward mindset. And we're going to explore this a little bit in more detail. And we're going to have, there's something that's going to happen in the room, right? So this thing about mindset, it's an internal thing, am I right? Mm -hmm. It's something that you can't really observe. It's very difficult to observe, right? Because I can't see if you have an inward or an outward mindset. So what we've done in Arbinger over the last 45 years is we started looking at how do people behave when they have a particular mindset. So you can see behaviors, am I right? But you can't see mindset. But there's certain behaviors that are attached to a particular mindset. And there's certain, and they are hard and soft in both inward and outward. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at how do people that have an inward mindset, how do they show up at work and at home? Okay, and the, there's no notes. So I think you might wanna make notes around this particular slide. So people that have a hard, hard inwardness towards others, right? What they tend to do is they behave in a particular way. Now, what they do is they will manipulate. Because remember, if I see you as a vehicle, I want you to do things for me. So I manipulate and control in, in, in fabulous ways, in smart, sophisticated ways. What I can do is I say, folks, this is in, the, in, the, in your KPIs. You should be helping me. And if you don't do that, you know what's going to happen to you? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, we're going to have a conversation. So it's just another you know, fascinating, sophisticated way we can get people to actually help us. So we manipulate, we control, and we threaten people. Have you seen that in the business? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Have you seen that in yourself? Yep. You okay, see. right. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's like it happens there, but it also happens with me. The next thing we tend to do is when we start to see people as obstacles, so they're in our way, right? We do this. We criticize people. So have you heard people criticizing other people in the business? We blame other people in the business and say, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. Have you gone to meetings where people, they just sit and they blame one another, right? So you see that inward mindset showing up and I punish people. Okay, that's what I do. When people are irrelevant to me, those people there right at the back, you know, not people, those chairs, right? When I do is I ignore people. I exclude people from processes because they are a problem to me. Why would I invite people to a meeting when I know they're going to create problems for me in the meeting? I might not even share information with them. I just ignore them. 
Okay, and I, sometimes when I engage with them, it's only a nice tokensies. Don't really care about them. It's just very superficial. So that's typically what I would do. Exclude, ignore. Now that's hard. Can you see how that could be hard, right? So let's take a look at the soft side, how people show up when they're inward. This is fascinating. What I do is, when I'm inward, I would indulge you. I would pander and I would try to be like, so it's almost like everything goes, you know, I don't really care about you because you're irrelevant to me, okay? Or you're just a vehicle to me. You're not impacting my results. What I also often do is I avoid people, okay? I would cope with people and I would leave situations. So he, I'll give you some examples just now. And the lastly is I, when I see people as objects, I only engage with them in nice tokens and I offer them little feedback. So these are the things we do when we're inward. So how often do you see this in the business happen? Behaviorally, right? So it's when people criticize, they blame, they belittle other people. We sometimes refer to this as they recruit other people, they speak about other people with other people. They actually blame people, they criticize, they threaten and control. Have you seen that happen in the business? Yes. Okay, so let's first talk about, so that's them. Let's talk about us. Okay, so here's a couple of things. This is where I show up. When I'm inward, I tend to go to this side. I go to the cope, avoid, and leave. And that's a way that how I show up. I don't want to deal with conflict, right? But I draw the edges, things go, and see where it goes. So this is me, Kubis, very often. Cope, avoid, leave situations. And then sometimes when it gets really tough and there's certain things that needs to happen and if you don't help me with what I want to achieve, then I'm going to blame you and I'm going to criticize you and I'm going to, in nice ways, threaten you. So I start very often on the soft side and then I move over to the, to the hard side of being inward. So I want to ask you, Pick three things. What are the three things that you often do at work and at home when you have this inward mindset? What behaviors do you show up? So if you can just make, say, this, 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 this is what I typically do. Okay. What would you say is that? Okay. So let's hear. Where do you think you play? More on the hard side, more on the soft side. So who's got more behaviors on the soft side? Okay. More hard? It's, there's more soft than hard, do you see? So what happens in a company where everyone avoids issues, <laughs> leaves issues? You know, we just engage with one another nice tokens, and we offer one another little feedback. What do you think is going to happen in that system? Very little. Very little is going to happen. It's going to feel like the, the system is stuck. Now you can imagine if everyone operates in this way, avoid, leave, and then you have some outliers that actually go to the blame, criticize, and they're very hard, right? See how it plays out in the business. So that's inward. Let's take a look at what outward actually means. So outward has a hard side, but it also has a soft side, like inward. So here's a couple of things that happens. So when I'm outward, I typically do these things, and this is fascinating. So when people are people to us in a business, we would very often set people up for success. We would challenge people. We would set high expectations for people. We will keep people accountable okay, for their delivery. I would offer people a lot of feedback. I would correct people if I see something is going wrong in the business. Okay, and I will have the necessary difficult conversations. So that's what I would do when I'm hard outward because I'm focused on what we need to achieve here, right? How often does this happen in the business? So I, I see a couple of nods going, now you're on camera, right? So I get that, okay? <laughs> that's maybe why you say, let me not actually put myself here in a very a predicament, okay? But do you see that in the business happen or not? That's the question. So that's hard outward. Let's take a look at what soft outward looks like. So here's soft outward. I listen and learn. I show genuine appreciation for people. I, I involve people in processes. I acknowledge when I'm the problem in the business. Okay. I actually take correction easily and I make changes where I see I'm 
impacting other people negatively. Is there people going around doing those types of things in the business? They listen, they really try and understand, they show appreciation for people, they actually take correction easily, and um, they involve other people in processes. Okay, so now I want to, if you look at this whole picture, like now, right? How would you see where does AFQI more often function? In the inward mindset, if you look at the behaviors, or on the, on the outward side, in the, in the blue part? Where, where do you see the behavior shows up? Because remember, that, that's revealing to mindset. What would you say? Uh, I'd like to put a ball somewhere. <laughs> yes, yes, do that. Where, where would you put the ball? Uh, I think from an outward side, it would probably be on the line between soft inward and, and outward, uh, more gravitating to the outward soft as well. Okay, so it's more on, on this side over here. It's depending. I mean, it differs from person to person you're dealing with. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think if you're talking about AFRI as a whole, yeah, definitely. There. Okay, all right. So it actually helps us to say where do we need to actually spend more of our time, you know, more on the blue and which side of the blue. Okay. So we're going to do something, and now it's going to be a bit revealing, okay? We're going to do, we're going to assess AFRI. And then we're going to assess where you think your division, which you represent here, do they operate on this continent, okay? So we want to know, right? Because if we don't know, like Jim Collins says, if you don't get honest about where you are, you can't actually grow your company. We need to know where we are. So where would you rate AFGRI at this stage? Now, it's going to be very challenging for us if we all had to get up now and do the rating. We would have loved to do that, but that's going to create so much you know, challenges for us. So if you rate it, where would you rate it? Would you rate AFCRI around about a five or would you say it's a seven or would you think it's a two? So if you can just quickly, just share it to the person sitting closest to you, where do you think AFCRI is on this inward outward mindset? So is there, is there more inward behaviors or is there more outward behaviors or is there a combination of inward and outward? Where do you think you would position the company as a whole? So if you can just say, give it a number. A one, so one means is it is almost inward the whole time. Two is also inward. Now, four, five starts to already gravitate towards outward. Five, six is more, it's outward and inward. And then eight, nines and tens, it's persistently, consistently outward. Where would you position the company? Do you just can we just add to that? Um, yeah. There are different businesses representing yeah. here. So I think what you need to do is to focus on the business that you are part of and evaluate that business because it might not be Africa, it might be full Africa or Cambium or you know, oh, so these we're gonna get business. It. Oh yeah, so I just want you to first the group and then okay. I'm gonna we'll ask you. AGH as a group on the question. Yes, the just the first the group and then we're gonna talk about your part right. of the business. So how would you, what would you say? Let me just, and no one can see you right from the back so that helps a lot, <laughs> okay. <laughs> what would you say, so what do you think is? Four, four, five. Four, four, five. Four. 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 So they, it seems like, and I'm, uh, this is not scientific, but it seems like there's a general, some consensus of a four. Yeah. If you think about your own business that you represent, how would you score your own business? Two. Two. Eight. I've heard an eight. What, what do you think? Four. 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 Also four. Six. Okay. Six, seven, okay. So we have varied numbers here, but it seems like there's a consistent perception about the group that it's a four, but there's differences inside. So I want to ask you, if you think about yourself as a leader in this business, as an employee, <coughs> what score would you give yourself? <laughs> Nine, okay, we've got that. Who, let me ask you, who's, who's, got, who's got more than an eight? Anyone that's got more than an eight? Towards yourself. Yeah, towards yourself. Okay, we've got one here, right? Anyone else? He's an intern, yet to serve. Uh, see that. <laughs> <laughs> Very short time. Who, does, who has almost like just, so I'm going to give you vague numbers. Let's say seven, six, five. Who has numbers like that where you see yourself? Okay, right, okay. And anyone lower, that would be the rest of the group, right? Am I right? if I make that assumption. So the question is, it seems like the way that you've looked at AFGRI, it's that it's a four, but it seems like you evaluate yourself higher than AFGRI. Am I right? Mm -hmm. 
And it might be that some people might even actually evaluate themselves even higher than their own division. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How is that possible? Because you're part of the system. So how, how is it possible? So there's two things that we need to consider here. One might be is, what am I going to do to help the rest of my team and my organization to get to a 8, 9, and 10, right? Um, that could be one option. The other option is, is it possible that you might be deceived about the impact that you have in the business because you're part of the business? Mm -hmm. How is it possible to say, they are like this, but I'm not like this? when you're part of the system. It's just a, a question for now. Okay. okay, so let's go into this a little bit easier, so a little bit deeper. What happens, now you will see this, so there's certain outcomes that's also associated with one of these two mindsets, people who makes it easier for people and people who makes it harder. They have different outcomes when they engage with people and the first thing they do typically is people that have, and this is this is also on page, I think, four, still part of this inward and outward, easier, harder, is people who have an outward mindset, they have sight. They can actually already also think, what is it that other people need? What can I do to be helpful to them? Because they're interested in them and their goals and their objectives, right? But people who have an inward mindset, they are blind. Yeah. They can't see because they're not interested in what other people need to do. And very often they become and they do things that are not helpful to other people. So, they mis so misalignment is a huge thing that happens in companies which are inwardly focused because no one cares about what's, what's the impact that I have on other people. Two, so you would see, is collaboration a, a big issue in this business? Yeah. Okay, so where you find collaboration happens naturally in a business is where you have more people that are outward. If silos is a thing that's actually plaguing this company, it is because people don't care about other people. They're just focusing on their part of the business and what they do. So they don't care about how they impact other parts of the business. So silos is more often associated with people and a collective that have an inward <coughs> mindset because they're just thinking about themselves. So, so what would you say is, is more prevalent in, in Afgri? Silos or collaboration? Silos. Okay. Very often it is the way that the performance management has been set up. Because if I'm being evaluated on my performance, then I'm not going to care about you. Yeah. So very often there's also systems and processes that drives this inward mindset in a company. Next one, accountability. So when I will find in a company where people are more outward, they are much more accountable for the impact that they have on other people because they know what other people need to achieve and then naturally they keep themselves accountable. What happens in, in companies where you have this inward mindset, you actually have the opposite. You have this blame. You're not doing this for me. You're not doing that. You're not helping me. So you have a lot of blame going on in a, in a company where there's inward mindset. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, right. Because I'm going to blame you because you're not helping me with my results, right? I don't care about your stuff. I just care about how f quick you're going to deliver this to me and my business. Okay. Next one. Someone spoke about innovation this morning. I think it was the lady over here. Am I right? Innovation. Who spoke about innovation? Ah, that's right. It was here somewhere. So uh, it's so interesting that we found that in companies where there's innovation is because I know what you need to achieve and I start to think about what can I do to be more helpful to you. We've just worked with a, with a client, and I'm not going to share the example, I'm going to share the example, but not the company name. We had a company where people, and this, was, this happened last week, they operated in silos. So they have various businesses operated in silos. CEO said, I can't get these people to work together. How are we going to do this? So we started working with one particular part of the business. And we've just heard last, last week that the one division started talking to the other division, okay, discussing how we impact one another. That translated into a 50 million deal, 50 million rand deal. Sure. Same people from the same business because that's where the innovation lies, the opportunity lies between the silos. They had another conversation, another colleague, because they had a mutual client, but they were actually going against one another at the same client. What they've done is 100 million rand deal coming off because 
the company started to talk to one another. The people in the business started thinking about how can I help people in the rest of the business being successful, not just my division. Okay. So that's what happens when you actually turn outward. Okay. Last name. Engagement. What is the, so, Chris, are you probably one of the best people to actually speak about engagement? Okay. What does the engagement scores or the cultural scores say about the company? How are people engaged in, in the business? What would you say? A five or six? No, I think it's lower. Um, yeah, let's take on five. Okay, <laughs> let's take an average, right? An average radio. Okay. So, I'm not going to be engaged because I'm not interested in you and what you need to achieve. So you would often find in companies that shows up where there's low engagement and low morale in the company is because people don't care about other people in the business. So low engagement, equate that to outward mindset where you have larger engagement. And there's also more friction in companies that have inward mindset. Lastly, um, growth. Where people, and, and I've just shared with you that case study, you know, when, when people start to think how can we collaborate together, how can we be more innovative together, that's actually where you can actually grow the business. But in companies where people are just focusing on their own objectives and their own areas, it's all about reputation. I don't care, it's about my part of the business. So those are some of the outcomes that actually relates to each one of these mindsets. So we're going to get into this, how do I turn outward? What's, what's the process um, to follow when we want to turn outward? So first of all, we need to know that we're inward. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? Are you inward or outward today? Do you know about other people in the business? Do you know about what they need to achieve? Do you, are you aligned with their objectives or not? <coughs> or do you, I don't know, right? I don't know. If you get to that point where you say, I don't know, that's the best place to be, okay? Because at least we know where we're going to depart from. So. We're going to take a look at this whole thing about SAM. So it's, it's an acronym that we use for a particular way of thinking about this. And this is in page six of that small little booklet. So here we have this pattern. So this, you would find probably you've done this yourself in the past or present, okay? And sometimes other people do this towards us as well. But we're going to just first of all talk about this pattern. So this pattern has got three typical ways of looking at it. The first place is see others. So I want to ask you, how do you see the people in the business? Do you see the other people in the business that they have got goals, they've got objectives, they've got work that they need to accomplish as important as your own? Or do you see people mainly as objects? They, they problems, obstacles, they are irrelevant, I don't even know what they want to achieve, never engage them. Or is it more of, yeah, I'm interested, I know what's going on in that business and I know what I can do to help them to move forward. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to see others and when we see others, we are concerned about others, about what they need to achieve. Okay. So I want to ask you, who is the person in the business that you have a challenge with right now? The person that makes it the hardest for you in your job. Who's that person? You know that person? Mm -hmm. Okay, keep that in <laughs> mind. Okay, keep that person in mind. Okay, so I wanna ask you if we think about this outward mindset, what do you know about their challenges? What, ah, oh, someone says, I hear nothing, right? What do you know about what they need to achieve? What do you know about the burdens that they carry themselves? What do you know about those things? Okay. It seems like there's no heads turning in any direction at this stage. People are looking at me and say, I, I, perhaps I don't know. Okay. So the first point of departure, if you want to help things go right, okay, 400%, you need to understand that. Even if you don't know, you're going to be dead in the water. Okay. Next part. So if I understand them, understand their challenges, their needs, their objectives, what can I realistically do that would be helpful to them? Now you can imagine if we don't understand what people want and their needs and their objectives, I might actually deliver the wrong things to them in the way that I actually take my work and my, offer my services or products or work to them, I might actually create more problems because it's not aligned to what they want to achieve. So if I don't understand them first, 
whatever I'm going to do might not hit the target. Okay. So the second part is, what can I then do to adjust? Third, measure impact. Now this is very often a part of this process that people actually neglect because who of you have been in business where you think, okay, I know what my client wants, I know their needs and their objectives, this is what we're going to do as a business to help them achieve their objectives. So because that's what we do as clients, right? Client-centric is that's what we want to do. This third piece is, is we need to go back to our clients and say, is what we've delivered to you, what service or product we've delivered, did it help you achieve your objective? And very often in business, we don't do that. And it's an iterative process. So every three, four months, we actually need to speak to our clients, what are your needs and objectives? Has it changed? Because we work in a, in a very complex environment in South Africa and globally, where people's needs and objectives, they constantly change, right? And we can't have the same approach for all our clients because every client has a specific need and objective. And we need to have actually, when we adjust our efforts, we need to do something very specific for them can't have a one-shot approach for everyone. And then we need to go back to our clients and say, what we've delivered, is it helpful? Or we need to go to look at our data and analytics and say, is, is there an uptake for our product or service? Very often, when people are inward, they don't care about what the client wants. They actually just push product and service onto the client. And then they wonder, hey, but we, we have this huge R&D division that folk is it focused on achieving what we want to achieve or is it focused on what the client wants? And if we know what the client wants, we can start to say, but what can we realistically do to help the client? And then we need to measure the impact. Is there uptake? Is there a, is there a change in our, in our profits given that clients are buying from us? So we have to do this third piece. Now, so we can do this whole process in four directions. Okay, so you would see on page six, we can apply this pattern towards our manager person we're reporting into, we can apply this towards our peers, our direct reports, and to our clients. Okay, so I want you to pick a direction. I want you to pick someone from that circle, if we had to apply this outward mindset, okay, and I want you to say, who is that person? First of all, what do I know about their needs and their objectives? Have I had a conversation with them in the past to actually get clear about what that is? Yes or no? Okay, if it's no, fantastic. Then we know where we need to start. Okay, so my invitation to you is, is to say is, let's set up a conversation post this 90 minutes when we walk out of here and let's go and experiment. Okay, <laughs> experiment, that's, that's life is about one big experiment sometimes, right? So I want to ask you, how do we set this up? Because it would be, if you had never asked this person in the past what their needs and objectives are, they're going to say, where have you been? Have you been with Krista? Right? What, what, what were you drinking? Right? What's going on here? You know, people might actually meet us with some suspicion. What do you want? What do you want? Okay, that's the words. So the way that I normally set this up, when we don't understand other people's needs and objectives, I would say is, you know, I've been, think, I've been asked to think about people in the business that I have a huge impact on. So I'm not coaching, I'm just saying this is what, how I would approach it. And I want to ask you, do you have 10 minutes or 15 minutes for me at a time that would suit you? Because I want to come and understand some of your needs and your objectives. Because I think the way that I've engaged with you or your team or your division, it hasn't been helpful. And if we want to grow this company, I need to get much more clear about your needs and objectives. Okay. That's the point of departure. And all I want to ask you is go into the conversation and listen. Don't go into the conversation justifying why you've done it in this way. Because if you start to get into justification, people are just going to say, oh, here we go again, right? Mm -hmm. So just go in and say, let me go in here. It is not a reflection on you, it is a reflection on what we need to change. And very often people feel it's going to be a personal attack on me and I'm not being... No, it's just give that person the opportunity to speak about how you impact them. Then I would suggest do not make any commitments in that, in that conversation because the purpose there is just to listen. I think take some time out because very often when we, when we want to make adjustments, these adjustments are not just 
our own adjustments because sometimes it's our, our teams and our divisions that needs to make certain adjustments because if you commit to something now you're actually committing on behalf of 10 or 12 or 15 other people and you haven't had a conversation with them so go and take some time out and say but what can i do differently for this person to help things go right then i want to say is say to this person in the first part of the conversation she says i'm going to come back to you in two weeks time or in a week's time and we're going to have a follow-up conversation about how myself or my team is going to try and help you assist you achieving your objectives so there's a particular reason why you don't commit in the listening session because very often people say yeah that's what i'm going to do i'm going to and then you realize hey i can't do that okay realistically so listen move away Think about what do I want to change differently, what am I going to do, and then set up a conversation with some commitments that you feel that you can help this person with. Now, when a person says to you, I need help from you 10 or 20 things, right? Because that's when you start to listen and learn about what they want to achieve. Very often what happens is that you, can't, you can only help them with four things perhaps. And that is, that is when we, we also have to manage the expectations about what we can realistically deliver to them. And that's fine. I think that's part of the communication going on is, I'm going to help you with this. Would this be helpful? And I'm going to come and check in every three weeks to actually keep myself accountable for this, what I've committed myself, me and my team, to you to say, how are we moving the needle on this particular issue? So it's, it is an iterative process. Now I want to ask you, let's go back to people in your life that have made things easier for you. Isn't this how they operate? They always ask you, what can I do to be helpful to you? Is there anything that you're working on that I'm not aware of? And then they start to, to position themselves in such a way that they help you. And then very often they would come back and say, was that helpful or not? So have you seen that process? And very often we've done that ourselves, but sometimes when we get into this inward mindset, we become increasingly stupid. We don't think about other people and how we impact other people in the business. So really, that's why I say to you is, go and ask people, what is it to work and live with me? So I'll tell you a little bit of a story. I think I want you to, to get this whole thing about this pattern. Now, this is a story from my own life. And I think, you know, stories always landed much better for me than theory. So one of the things, when my mom was still alive, what she loved was Estee Lauder's Red Door. You still, those ladies, you know that? You know, I don't even know if you get it anymore, right? Do you still get it? You get it, okay. So my mom, so I would, of, ever often I would travel overseas and then I would, when my dad passed away, I thought like he would always buy her perfume, okay? And then it was the, the, the great idea for me, I would always buy something on the, on the airport to take home as a present. She loved it. She absolutely, she actually said, so when are you going overseas? Because she knew <laughs> I would buy. So for me, that was a huge treat for her. But as I was on the airport, very often I would also buy my wife perfume as well. Then we get home. And then I would say, so here's something that I bought. And she says, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And she put it away. That's strange, you know. I get this reaction from my, from, my, from my mom, but when I give it to my wife, it's not the same expression and, and, and gratitude, right? And this went on for three or four years. Every year. But now it starts to bug me. I actually, it's somewhere I started resenting the fact that I need to buy perfume for my wife, but she doesn't like this, right? Not to the same extent as my mom does. So one year, when I was in America, one of my good friends, we, we would go for walks in the morning, you know, as a way of trying to keep off the fat, okay? Keep ourselves lean. We had this conversation. I said to him, John, you know, you need to take me back to the airport because I need to go 30 minutes earlier because I need to still go and buy perfume, right? I need to go. And I said, you know, but while we're on this topic, you know what bugs me, right, about my wife? She doesn't like the perfume as much as what my mom likes. And um, he says... At some, he's listening to me, he says, you don't know your wife. I said, you know, I've been married for 10 plus years, how can't I know my wife? He says, I don't think you know your wife. So he says, I think you need to go home and you need to really go and understand your wife better. 
So I thought, like, gee, I, might, I thought I knew, but let me try, you know, because he really has a huge influence in my life. So we get home, I give the perfume to my, my mom, same reaction, gave it to my wife, same reaction. So I said to her, I want to ask you, whenever you are ready in this week, I want to have a conversation with you. And, you know, for my wife, that's fantastic when I want to have conversations. You know, <laughs> normally it's she wants to have conversations with me. So we, we sat down this evening and I said to her, I just want to ask you is, what is it to be a wife to me? What is, how do I impact you? What are the things that are going on in your life right now? What are the challenges that you experience? And normally my, my, the way that I normally communicate is you need to get down to the point within 15 minutes, okay? Get to the point. So this, this evening I said, no, I'll open up my whole diary so that I can really understand. So we had a long conversation. So at some stage we got to this topic because I thought like, let me just hear what's, what's going on. This, this perfume thing bugs me. So I said to her, so help me understand. Why don't you like this? And she said, Quibus, you know, if, if I really want to have perfume, I'll go and buy it. I don't need that. And I said, so what do you need? Right? What, what's some of the things that would be important to you? And she said, I need more of your time. That's more important than perfume. Right? Now, I want to try and, and illustrate this whole thing about outward mindset. So sometimes when we're inwardly or outwardly nice, we think we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. But actually, we're still in this inward mindset. We do things for other people that we think would be helpful to them. If we understand other people and, we, and when we listen and learn from them, we know what they need and then we can, and I said to her, oh, time, is that the thing? Okay, what if we do things a little bit different at home and I'll change my program a little bit uh, around this, would that be helpful to you? She says, fantastic, that is what I'd like. And so when we adjust our efforts, then we get aligned to what people need. And you know, very often she still, re she reminds me of that conversation when I really truly listened to her, saw her as a person, not as a problem, not as a vehicle, not as a irrelevancy. What is it that she needs? Then I can start to adjust, adjust my efforts. So now my, my measurement becomes is, is this time working for you? Can we adjust this? And it's a continuous conversation. Now that happens in business as well, that same pattern. If we understand what other people really want, we can start to adjust what they really want. And that's where things are going easier for everyone involved. So I hope that I could illustrate with the, the story is, start out with see others, see what they need. Think what can I do to be realistically more helpful to them? And then let's measure the impact. So go home tonight, you know, go and speak to people that are important to you. Go and speak to your children and say, what is it to be my, you know, to be your father or your mother, right? Get the feedback, right? So remember, outwardly soft means I'm open for feedback. I'm open for correction. That's part of being outward. But if I'm inward, I don't care. I don't care how I impact other people at home. So that's going to be my invite for you is to say, but what do I need to know about the people at home and at work? So let me just quickly run you through. So start with seeing others adjust efforts, measure impact. So I want to ask you, when you leave this room, you know, go out to that person and say, I need to make an appointment and I really need to get much, a, a much better understanding of their needs and, and things that they need to take care of. And what can I do to be more helpful to them? Set up the conversation, right? Help things go right. Make it easier for other people to work with you. That's outward mindset. Now I want to ask you is, imagine if we had to work like this in Afri, where everyone is interested on in how they impact other people in the business. How would the business be different? Hey, say, say that, I want to hear what. Yeah, when then we, we don't need to do all these other things. We just need to actually turn towards what we can do to help other people. So what I want to share with you is Chip again. My team's Chip. Oh, let me go. So here's Chip. Look what happened. This is just a snippet of when he changed and an influence he had on his team as a consequence of him seeing people that they needed to, you know, get together and out of the system. 
but what happened with his team when he started turning outward? Okay, so here's his, here's his story. My team was tasked with serving a high-risk search warrant in search of two homicide suspects. Uh, we proceed to the home. As we're making our approach, the occupants become aware of our presence, and uh, we smack the door immediately with the ram. Door flies open, in go a couple of flashbangs. These flashbangs detonate, we move through the house. When we enter this threshold, it's complete pandemonium. There are people running everywhere, diving under beds, hiding in closets. Uh, we've got screaming children clinging onto our legs as we're trying to clear this house. We get everybody collected and secured, and we kind of corral them into this living room area, this dining room area that had been furnished with two couches. With all of these people, we're talking probably two dozen people in this room, it is incredibly loud, and made worse by the fact that these babies that these mothers have are screaming. And I look around trying to explain to people what's going on. I, I, I can't get a word in. And I look around and I see that Bob Evans, my point man, has disappeared. And I'm, I go looking for him. And so I walk into the kitchen and I see Bob in full tactical gear standing with his back to me facing the sink. I get a little closer to see what's going on and I discover Bob standing at the sink mixing baby bottles. I mean, here's this guy, uh, the, the toughest of these alpha males, standing there mixing baby bottles and I'm just shocked by this. And he looks at me, kind of smiles knowingly, kind of shrugs, carries these bottles out to the dining room area and distributes them to the mothers of the crying children. And this whole scene shifts automatically. Everybody calms down, I'm able to explain why we're there and I just was amazed by the radical transformation in an instant. Uh, all, all of that hinged on Bob's responsiveness. Okay, so what did you hear from this clip? Could you see the whole thing about see others, adjust efforts, measure impact? So I want you to ask you, can you see this in this dynamic? Where, where did the see others part start? Instead of going and doing what he's supposed to do and get other people arresting and all that, he saw that, okay, there's, he saw the babies and said there's a need there. And yes. And he, he adjusted his behavior and said to the babies and then everybody adjusted and said, okay, this guy is not just here to kick, but he's, he's, he's as, as great. So if, if, and that's fantastic, if he saw that whole scene as people that are problems, obstacles, how do you think he would have reacted? Everybody around kids would have continued screaming, their mother screaming because the mother, the babies are screaming and nobody would get anything done. Okay. Everybody would be frustrated. And everything goes slow, yeah. right? Okay, so please, for the gentleman right at the back, okay. So we could see the, the C others, we could see adjusting efforts, how did we, how could we see from the story measuring impact? What was the impact that one guy started having on this whole scene? What was the, what did he say? Calmness. Calmness, right? Serene, we're getting our job done, but we're getting our job done in a different way when we start to see what others need to do. It still means we, we're going to take them to jail, right? Mm -hmm. But we do it in a different way. But we see people, we don't see problems. Right? People, I would say, people deal with problems. People are not problems. And very often as leaders, we actually mix the two. We're saying you are a problem when actually you're working on a problem. So, ma'am, I also looked at you when you said calmness. So, there's the book. Okay. So, I want to share with you a last clip, more from a business perspective. What happens? when you change mindset. And then we'll have a conversation and let's open up the floor for some questions that you might have, some observations, things that you're thinking about that we, we could be helpful to you. Okay, so here's the last story. This is Luis Francisconi coming up. So just to give you a bit of a perspective of Luis's job. So she was the VP for youths at some stage and then she became the VP for Raytheon. And she was considered one of the most influential women leaders in the world under the top 50 round about 2007 and 8 and how she changed the whole company when she changed right in some way but here's a story okay Hughes Raytheon by the time I left was really the amalgamation of four different missile businesses 
And so there was a huge mix of people. We had very different cultures. Just even the engineering and manufacturing mix was the first time we were all together. And we had such a huge job to grow the business. I mean, it was hard. We were, we were forced to consolidate because the business was in such bad shape. When you had to solve a problem or when something wasn't going your way, they were table pounders, they, were, they yelled at each other, and you'd get into meetings and, and, the, and the decibel level was just huge. When you really leave a meeting when it's not happening, I mean, you get back in your office, you, you shut that door, and you're really honest with yourself. You know it's because you weren't communicating right, you weren't focused on the right issues, personality got in the way, opinion got in the way. You weren't working towards one goal. And, and you know that. You know that as a leader. You just don't know how to change it. It's that we weren't solving problems. We were just piling on. And it got so bad, I was thinking of quitting. You know that old expression, no change, no change, no change. You can just try harder, have more meetings, you know, dress it up any way you want. It doesn't change. It was clear to me right away that Arbinger, by getting people to focus on what you can do to make others succeed had an accelerator effect that I was personally very excited about as the leader of the business. That was a tough limb for me to go out on as a woman in the defense industry who had primarily men work for her, tough men. Because I had to believe so clearly that this was not some soft skill soft, soft sort of thing, because that is the last thing as a female leader running a missile business that I needed or wanted. We exposed or trained people uh, deeply in the organization, uh, even through our, our represented or hourly folks. So we went very, very deep within the organization. It's not just casual interface. It's, it's very rich, hard work. It's that focus on success, the result, the answer, in a way that focuses on others, that is so accelerating that culture moves around it. Arbinger is not about training. It's about exposure to a concept. And you, as a leader, have to think deeply about it, okay? But then you have to practice it. You have to work at it. And that's the beauty of having a team around you that is exposed to it and that is trying to practice it at the same time. Because it's, it's a growing thing. You don't, you don't just wake up one day and work at A-level Arbinger, okay? You, you, you grow with it, you practice with it, you, you develop it, you, you learn it. And it had huge impact on union negotiations, how we held meetings, how we communicated, uh, huge difference. When we first started to really use uh, an Arbinger approach to develop our goals for the organization, it probably took us a day when we first started. Eventually we got down to half a day. Eventually we did it in one hour. Twenty people collaboratively in a room in the course of one hour would come up with complex goals for a six billion dollar business that were about every piece of the organization succeeding. It, it was Nobody believed you could do it. Nobody. Now what you do with those other seven hours, that's where you leave the other group behind. <laughs> you leave the competition in the dust. It's fabulous. We doubled the business in a, in a time when people didn't even think we could grow 5%. And just the human way we communicated with each other to me was critical. Did we still have problems? Yes. Um, did we make every milestone? No. Could we solve and move forward technical problems in a way that we never could before? Absolutely. Answers came to things in how to interface with subcontractors or suppliers that we'd been working literally for years to figure out. It's again one of those things that people say it was magic. And some people say it can never be repeated again, and they're wrong because it was a way we went 
about it. They're just hard work, work in the right way. Okay, so the way we think about it, and you've heard Louise's examples, you've seen Chips' examples, this is more than 400% in the way they've worked. Double the business in a time where people thought they can only grow 5%. Chips' example, sustainable change for 10 years, no lawsuits against, filed against him. So if you start to, if you want to make your life easier, you know, even if it's just an individual or a team, make things easier by applying SAM. You would be astounded by what happens and how people start to interface with you when you are interested in what they do and how you can do what you can do to be helpful to them. They will experience you differently, you will get different engagement, you will get different help from that person. But if you go inward and you don't care about them, then like you've said, then they might not even help you. They might not be interested to help you. And that's where the that's where the culture comes from. How do we collaborate with one another? So I hope, so I'm just on my time boundary with you, which is about an hour and a half. I want to keep asking you, go home tonight. Ask people what is it to live with you. Understand their needs and their objectives and see what you can do. But also apply that back at work. Okay. So um, if you want to know more about this, I've given some books. There's some two more books coming out that I just want to get some thoughts and feedback from you, questions. It's the Outward Mindset book. And then I also want to ask you if, if you want to learn more about this. We've got public programs if you want to attend or if you want to speak to your HR department or people in the business that can actually get us to come and work on particular issues with you in the business, we will gladly do that. This is not a sale. I'm just saying to you there's different ways to engage with us. That you if you want to move forward so this is not about me this is about you your questions and your thoughts about what you've heard this morning okay because it's just a, a nugget okay may i take some questions things observations perhaps just the name first Mersha. Mersha. what creates an inward mindset what would be the cause of so many people just focusing on what's going uh, what it's about me my initial response was, I remember when I was first exposed to this, is very often we don't even know that we're inward. And we think the things that we do is outward, but it's actually inward. So very often it's not people that come in being malicious or being intentionally being inward. They just don't know that they're inward. They have not been exposed to ideas. So that's, I think, you know, I want to lay it down to Chris, is exposing people to ideas and concepts to actually realize, help them realize when they're inward or outward. In my own experience sometimes, also this inwardness comes from, you know, long time back in my life, okay? The way that I've been grown up, the way that I've been socialized, there's many factors that actually contribute by, by me being inward. Don't care about the rest. Yep. Oh, and then you get a book. Big pleasure. Some other thoughts? Um, yep, there's, can sorry. You just, can you just take the mic? Oh, the mic, yes, can please. Make sure on the recording. Okay, um, my thoughts. Um, I think you switch no, it. Is it just on? for the camera recording. Oh. It's not is it on? Oh, whoa, okay. I get it wrong. Thank you so much for um, helping me. It's, it's a lot of uh, mixed thoughts that I have. Um, you were uh, talking about asking a question at home and then coming to work and asking a question at work. Mm -hmm. um, what I was thinking is the different roles we play. Mm -hmm. Because at home I'm a mum and then I play a different role there and I might get a different answer there. And then I come to work, I'm a colleague. So I might get a different answer here. How do I balance all that? Being a mom, being a wife, being a grandmother, being a colleague. How do I, um, look, I'm gonna most probably get different answers, right? And then how do I see myself after that? Okay, so the question was, if, if I had to have multiple conversations with people, how would, how would I balance all these different roles that I have? I think what I've found is that 
if I have an inward mindset, I don't care how I impact other people. I would not even know how to balance things. But if I have more conversations with people that I impact and they give me feedback, I can actually listen, I can comprehend, I can say, but how can I make tweaks in all of these areas? That's where the balancing comes in. So the balancing does not come in before the conversation, the balancing on comes in. And you will have to figure out what that balancing looks like, right? But yes, you will definitely get different feedback from people. Yeah, for sure. So the balance is what happens afterwards. Sure. There was also a hand up. Okay. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you. It was actually very eye-opening for me. Um, so my question comes from uh, something I just realized from your talking. I had a situation in, the, in my working environment recently, and if I look at what happened, HR kept quiet, said nothing, stayed mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. Then my line manager went, oh, it's a small thing, don't worry, you'll get over it. But then my executive sat me down and asked, how can I help you fix this? And I was just wondering, <laughs> so I, sure, I'm actually astounded now. I've never realized how much of an impact she's had just by saying those words. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get that? Because now there's a break. There's a break between the executive and myself. My line manager should be asking that question and or HR or something like that. How do we help people to get into that kind of mindset? Um, so I'm very glad that your executive actually you know, what we would say in Arbinger honored his or her sense to say is let me just go and have a conversation and understand what your realities are because then we can do things. Um, I cannot, I, I do not know what the situation was with your direct line manager and with HR why they were not interested in this situation, but it begs a question what type of mindset they operated from. Because if they really cared about you, they would have asked. Yeah. I cannot judge them. I, 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 my question is more, is there something we can do to help them see that mindset, like, or build a better mindset? Oh, so how do we introduce this into the system? Yeah, yeah, those sorts of things. Okay. It's clearly up at the executive, but it's not further down. It is so interesting, I, and I, I've come across this um, in a couple of organizations where we work with. Very often, the disconnect in the business lies in the middle level management. So things happen at the top, and then it gets filtered down, and it's very often middle management that does not, is not aligned and agreeing with what Exco is doing, and then they filter the type of conversation and information in the way they see fit to the next layer. So, uh, you know, I can tell you what we would do from, from an organizational perspective, but I think your question is more, what can I do immediately? Is that the question? No, well, in general, it's anything. Okay. I think the first thing is we need to, to acknowledge that there's a problem. If we can see there's a problem, then we know where we can be of help. And you, you can speak to your HR person around this and change person, whether they would be interested to explore this further. Yeah, that's what I would suggest. Or, you know, sometimes, ah, here's a way to introduce the book. So, this is your book. <laughs> so, especially when it comes to leadership and self-deception, because that word already creates a lot of resistance. So, I would say to people something along the lines is, Here's a fantastic book to help you to manage me when I'm a problem. <laughs> so, because sometimes it's, it's just much easier because people, when you give people a book, they think, is there something wrong with me that you want to fix me? So it's actually, here's a book to help you manage me better, right? Because I know I'm a jerk, right? They, they would love to read that. So if you can maybe just send that to the back. Fabulous. Good question. Sure. Anything else? There's a hand there. Okay, let, we just want to get the mic to you. Sure. Thank you, Shantae. Um, I just want to say, I think mostly what we miss is to see how much we can develop by reading books. And um, 15 minutes a day can actually change your whole life. And I think most, mostly whenever you're, especially when you're in a leadership posi um, position, you should start doing self-development because that's the only way how you would really become a true leader and be able to see your own mistakes and correct it on a, on a daily basis because that's the only way where 
where if you read it in a book and you can see, it, for example, how it changed people's lives, that's the only way that you can actually change without feeling offended by somebody coming to tell you that I feel that you haven't um, shown compassion to me or whatever. So that's a nice way to actually change yourself and not feel the criticism from other people. Correct. I'm so glad that you bring this up. Who of you know of a lot of MBA people that don't make the mark? So if they've been, you know, they've got an MBA, they've got degrees, and they, you know, they, it seems like on a, if you look at their CV, they should actually be able to do this job, right? Mm -hmm. So research now in the last three to five years have shown that an MBA or a business degree will only get you so far. They've actually now started showing with research results that it is more the soft side of the EQ that you spoke about. That's what's going to get you beyond that. And very often we get stuck on just the technical side of our jobs. There's also a social side to our jobs that is, in some instances, if you get into a certain level in the organization, more important than the technical parts of your job. Absolutely, yeah. So you have to invest, not just in the technical side of your job, but also on the leadership, the social, the EQ side of your work as well. Absolutely. Thank you for, for emphasizing that. Anyone else? Anything that you would need more? So thank you very much for all the conversations. I hope this was meaningful to you. Maybe, and just go in the corridors and look at those behaviors and see how people show up. And then also, how do I show up? Do I avoid? Do I keep quiet? Do I blame? Do I criticize? Do I recruit? Or do I set challenges for people, have hard conversations with them? show genuine appreciation for people and acknowledge where I'm part of the problem. Just take a look at where you show up because that will, when you're inward, what, what you would see is when you're inward, other people are going to respond inwardly towards you. When you're outward, you have a better chance of them responding in an outward mindset towards you. Krista, maybe? Thank you, Kovas. Sure. Wow, let's give Kovas a hand. Thank you. The day that I really got respect for Kubis, um and Lindy is I approached them and I said, please, can you come and do outward mindset in our business? And they said, so what is the problem? And I said, well, I know what is the problem, but maybe we should ask the people. And he says, but Krista, if you're not going to, if the management and the leadership of the business are not saying this is our problem and we want to fix this, then we are not the right people to work with you. And I he, there was an opportunity for him to get involved, but he said, if you don't own this and want to change, then this is just going to be an information session. And today, if I look at the amount of people that are, that, that are in this room, you can go and make the change. But this can either be information, or we can take it and say, how can I integrate it just in the environment that I, that I focus in? Um, I saw the beautiful video of um, the equipment team, and I think it was the Weidach. Um, and it was, they took it with a drone, and when the drone got up, you saw this tent, and it was AFGRI service excellence. It is our value to have service excellence. And that means that we will, we will be excellent in how we service our client. Chris, two years ago, stood up here when he said, if we don't ask our client what is their needs, Microsoft is going to ask our clients what is their needs. And Microsoft is going to respond to our clients quicker than what we can respond to our clients. And we changed dramatically in two years. Our clients have changed. Their needs have changed. But the reality is what I heard Kuba said this morning. We've got internal clients here. And if we can start collaborating within the power of the group of people that we have together, and just the question, who can I go and serve? Not, this is my objective, people just need to get on track. It's just identify one person internally that we can go and sit down with and say, what is on your table and how can I help you? And when we have that attitude, we can start changing our mindsets internal. I think it's critical for us as an organization um, and for us as people to have that outward mindset in everything that we do. 
Another thing that I learned from Patrick is I sat down with him and I said, Patrick, what is your biggest challenge in your organization? And he said to me, Krista, sometimes we don't understand that we are just an head office. We are not the whole of the business. We've got a lot of branches and people out there <laughs> that is also part of this organization. And sometimes we just need to see the people at our branches as our biggest customers and how we can serve them. So I really appreciate this input. And may you just take one thing out of today and say, this is the one thing that I'm going to integrate and be different. Um, even if it just means go back to your home and ask, how is it living with me? Um, that really brought me to tears. <laughs> um, and immediately I wanted to change that because that is how, the way that I want to show up and the people that Whose life am I Im impacting closest? So please go and integrate these things in your life. Um, it is on video. Go and look at this again. Go and show it to your teams. And if you want to speak to us regarding how do we take our whole team through an outward mindset approach, um, you, can, you can just make contact with me. Um, I can set you on the right track with Kubis and, um, and Lindy. Um, but thank you for your time. Um, may this be a great... Um, it's financial month or year end, and I know there's a lot of things, but let's be outward in terms of planning the new financial year as well. So have a great, have a great time. Kubis, thank, thank you me. very much thank for you, your Krista. time. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Oh, sorry, the last thing I want to say, our next speaker, we invited Martin Kiskus back. Uh, Martin spoke to us about... Um, donkey. He is the CEO, he was the CEO of um, uh, SABS, and uh, Martin sp spoke to us about inclusion and exclusion and the importance of diversity. And I phoned Martin and I said, Martin, don't you want to come and speak to us about it again? Because if I hear what people are saying, then they say, this is still a problem for us. How do we cope in a diverse environment? And Martin said, mm, yeah, I'll come and talk about that again. Um, but Krista, isn't there something that is a real need? And I said, Martin, I really believe that where we are in our country, where we are in our company, is people need encouragement. And Martin said, well, I call myself a chief encouragement officer. He is the CEO, a chief encouragement officer. And he said, let me come and talk to everybody on how can you become a CEO in the area that you operate in because we all need encouragement. Something that struck me this morning when I stood at this robot, there's actually a sign, a big, big billboard up here saying, be kind. And I so believe that we are in a stage in our life where we need to be kind with one another because people are really going through some tough and heavy things. Um, but invite somebody in at, the, uh, at our next leadership session. Martin is going to be our speaker and um, we can all be CEOs walking out of here. So enjoy, enjoy the month. We see you all in, in March. Thank you.